<laughs> What's the album? Boom, 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 Track two. Boom, 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 Repeat. Hello, fellow legends. We are assembled here today to blaze. And first of all, we must pay tribute to today's glorious sponsor. Magic Spoon. Mm. 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 That's a 10. I don't just do this for my own pleasure. <laughs> And in fact, I have to say, a little bit of honesty here. Normally when I eat cereal, you don't think about the food getting stuck in your teeth and that being an issue. When you are recording a video where they ask you to eat the cereal on screen, it might be delicious, but it does get stuck in my teeth. I apologize, but look, despite that insane product defect, Magic Spoon, they are absolutely glorious. And they are the sponsor of today's video, Let Us Blaze. Hey! Oh wait, no, I've got to talk to you about Magic Spoon at the beginning. <laughs> Hold off on your blazing, let us blaze the sponsor. It says long pre-roll. Yes, sir. <laughs> Where the hell's my copy? <laughs> oh, I've got a personal message from... This is Magic Spoon here. And holy hell, do we love your business play spots. <laughs> Thanks, Magic Spoon. <laughs> this is my job. <laughs> you know the rules. Go wild with the sponsorship. And we'll keep you stocked up with that good, good magic spoon. I'm assuming the good, good there is not a typo because it is good, good. Twice as good. So good they had to write good twice. Um, what do we want to talk about magic spoon today? I always tell the story where I'm like, yeah, I'm a cereal. I loved it when I grew up. And then I was like, I shouldn't become really super obese. <laughs> Eat tons of sugar. So I kind of stopped eating cereal because it was a combination of all the sh** that's bad for you. <laughs> um, but the reality is that magic spoon came along. What does it say right here? Zero grams of sugar. <laughs> Wait, am I just telling the same story over again, even though I said I was going to tell a different story? <laughs> Four grams of net carbs. 13 grams of protein. Oh, yes. Um, they've also, I mean, this is the chocolate flavor that I'm eating today. Uh, I was eating a lot of peanut butter, but I'm down to my last two boxes. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> steady on, fact boy. Uh, I've also got some fruity, which, can I say, I, I mean... This is my least favorite flavor, generally, because I don't, um, I mean, it's good, it's fine. I'm not crazy about fruity cereals, but what I am crazy about, peanut butter, cocoa, um, what else? There's the regular sugar one, which is fantastic. Also, what? Oh no, this isn't peanut butter. <laughs> I got two. This is maple waffle, um, which I'm specifically not supposed to tell you about because it's not available right now. But what I would say is uh, I got a few boxes of this. It's extremely delicious. I don't even know if they're going to do it again, but they sometimes do like um, special flavors. There was cookies and cream as well. Mwah. Birthday cake, which I haven't even tried, but I assume. Mwah. Uh, look, I don't know how it works, but look, if you buy some Magic Spoon and our company's work where they've got something special, they're probably going to email you about it. So maybe buy some Magic Spoon, get on the email list and... I should get back to what they actually tell me to talk about because I think I'm specifically not supposed to. Let's move on. Um, read nutritional values verbatim because of legal reasons. Uh, okay. Oh, I did this already. Zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of net protein, only four grams of net carbs in each serving. Oh, also 140 calories. Only 140 calories, which is not a lot. I had a chocolate bar the other day. I was just curious. Look on the back. 370 calories. I'm like, it's like this big. <laughs> you f***ers. What have you done? It tastes amazing, and it is too good to be true. I mean, yeah, I agree. It tastes like it's super sugary, and it's not. Okay, look, my guy who organizes my ads was like, Simon, try to keep the Magic Spoon ads below 17 minutes. So I think we've covered the main points. Magic Spoon is fantastic. They let me do whatever you wa I want, because you legends actually buy lots of Magic Spoon, which is awesome, because it's awesome, and it's just this glorious cycle of capitalism where everybody wins. <laughs> Click the link below, use the code BLAZE for $5 off on Magic Spoon or uh, Magic Sp or just- That you, um, you had, you, you, you could, you do- So click the link below and use the code BLAZE for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com forward slash BLAZE and save $5 off your order today. Oh, it's also available in Canada, but not in Europe. People will be like, Simon, listen to your British accents. You must be loving this in Europe. No, I mean, I am. But I'm special. America and Canada, come on, Magic Spoon. <laughs>
Let's move on. Uh, this is Ingo in Indiegogo Fails. Indiegogo! I feel this is one of the worst name companies, allegedly. Uh, it's like Kickstarter, but worse. I was, uh, the, like, in Indiegogo is where you go if you got rejected from Kickstarter. It's like, hmm, you know what I'd really like to fund? A giant pyramid scheme. I'm not saying that Indiegogo do that. I don't know anything about it. I'm sure Danny has done some research and I'm just gonna... You know, just say allegedly, <laughs> allegedly worse. It must be a crushing feeling to just receive that dreaded email from Kickstarter, which informs you that your proposed crowdfunding project does not meet with the platform's guidelines and has regretfully been rejected. You've spent ages putting the pyramid scheme to get. <laughs> Just joking, your project together. With consideration and creativity, you've invested resources in sorting out persuasive little perks. You've told your friends and family to get involved in the pyramid uh, and ever. <laughs> and everyone on social media that the project will go live within the next couple of weeks. You've told your landlord that you'll be in a position to start paying rent again when the project gets funded and turns you into a millionaire. If I was that landlord, I'd be like, F off, mate, get a job, all right? Come on, back to the fields. <sighs> a man can dream though, a man can dream. But now the dream has turned to dust after reading a rejection email which doesn't even provide any helpful information on exactly what guidelines you've failed to meet. A friend of mine recently got his YouTube channel entirely deleted. It turned out to be a mistake. I just saw it, I saw it, I was watching a video of his, I think. And then I returned to it later and it was like, this video is unavailable. And I'm like, that's weird. If it was a copyright thing, it normally says like, you've got a copyright thing. But this was like the channel, and I was like, the channel doesn't exist. It was brought back a few hours later. It was just an error. But it's like, he got an email from YouTube being like, due to policy violations, we've terminated your channel. He's got hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And I'm like, that shit be scary. <laughs> Because that's how I pay my bills. And it could all go away, please, by magic spoon. Maybe it was the bit where you mentioned that your new home-brewed drink, cocaine fizz, probably didn't lead to permanent blindness. <laughs> probably. Maybe you shouldn't have thrown a pair of live chickens in as a perk. Whatever the reason, the opportunity has passed, and now there is only one last desperate course of action to take. You just have to try shoving the campaign on Indiegogo instead. A great opportunity squandered? Absolutely. A crushing blow? Yes. Will I get over it? Mm. No. Although Kickstarter usually gets all the attention and has perhaps become the embodiment of the crowdfunding scene, the less celebrated San Francisco-based Indiegogo actually launched a year earlier. In 2008, Indiegogo may not boast quite the same massive backing community behind Kickstarter, but it does feature a few notable differences. For starters, the guidelines and restrictions and vetting procedures are far less stringent, so you can usually get away with posting any old shit on there, allegedly. This is where I shall launch my cocaine fizz. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I wish that was legal. Outside of Colombia. And secondly, the flexible funding approach on the platform means that unlike Kickstarter, you don't necessarily have to hit your target goal to get your hands on the money. You can walk away with any investment to manage to, you manage to drum up, even if you only raised $15 of the proposed $20 million goal. If you're pro, oh, that is insane though. That makes no sense. Like, logically, right? Maybe I'm missing something. But if you're like, yeah, yeah, I want to put a satellite in space. It's going to cost $20 million. I need $20 million. And you raise $15. That money should go back to whoever the idiot was who pitched the $15. Because you can get that $15 and be like, all right, well, this buys me lunch on day one. And now the project's over. This naturally makes potential bankers a little more wary as they know they could be losing their investment on projects that clearly didn't, didn't, didn't prove to be successful and have zero chance of getting off the ground. So while you stand a better chance of getting your project approved on Indiegogo, you might not necessarily raise as much money from the smaller and more cautious community. <laughs> cautious, because it's like you could just lose it all. Stand, it's gone. That's not to say that Indiegogo isn't a massive ongoing success story in its own right. The platform has helped to bring life, bring to life thousands of successful projects over the years, but it also attracts the kind of loopy, bonky projects that you probably wouldn't find anywhere else. Uh, I, I think I've mentioned it before in one of the Kickstarter videos, but I've backed like a couple of Kickstarter projects, which I'm not going to name. They both turned out to be kind of shit. Strap and crap. When I was in my late, t oh god, are we going to be strapping something to ourselves so we can take a shit in the woods? Interesting. Just do it. When I was in my late teens and early 20s, I used to spend many a happy weekend camping out with a group of friends on the Derbyshire Moors in the Peak District. Me too, Danny. 
I had some great times growing up in the Peak District, just camping out. It was great. I say happy. No, oh. I never really wanted to go, but they always lured me out with the promise of free beer. I mean, it was usually all right, but I could never get my head around all the effort involved in traveling so far to spend the night drinking around a campfire when we could all just spend the night drinking at home. That is so sad. Joke's on you, I'm into that shit. And then got to sleep in a proper warm bed afterwards with no risk of getting mauled to death by a leopard. Uh, this, they eventually stopped asking me when I ended up ruining the experience by accidentally going missing, presumed dead, for 14 hours. Late at night, out on the wily windy moors, I needed to answer nature's call and stand behind a tree for a minute. There were girls in the group, so I decided to venture quite far out to get a bit of privacy. Is Danny taking a dump? Why didn't you just before you went? If I'm going camping for one or two nights, I'm taking a big sh** before I leave, and then really hoping that I don't have to take a shit in the woods. I once went to uh, Chernobyl <laughs> with some friends of mine, and uh, we're going on this tour around like Pripyat, which is the, the town where Chernobyl is based, and there's like these pockets of radiation everywhere. We're just going around, and my friend just, he hangs back from the group, the little, the tour group for a little bit, and then... <laughs> He catches up with us later and it's like, mate, where did you go? Nameless friends, where did you go? <laughs> He's allowed to take a Because <laughs> we'd been on this tour for the whole day. <laughs> like, I, I, I peed a couple of times in the woods. But like, you can do that. And he's like, dude, I went into the woods and it's like, bro, you know there are pockets of radiation, right? And he didn't have a Geiger counter. It's like, dude. <laughs> he took a shit in the woods around Chernobyl. <laughs> In the exclusion zone. And it was extremely funny, and I still find it funny today. Let's move on. <laughs> Sadly, I ventured a bit too far out and couldn't find my way back to camp, so I ended up wandering alone through the moors all night, feeling grateful that I at least grabbed the large communal bottle of whiskey for company. It's Danny, ow! Just be like, hello? 14 long hours later, my mates were traveling back home in their cars and purely by chance bumped into me as I was wandering dazed and confused around a village about 15 miles from camp, clutching an empty bottle of whiskey in my hands. This doesn't seem real. Although they generally seemed quite relieved that they'd found me, half of the group were annoyed that they'd spent all night in a panic hunting the bot around the bottom of the cliffs to find my body. So, like, where's Danny? He's been missing about 20 minutes. <laughs> Better start looking for a body. The other half were even more annoyed that I'd wandered off with all the whiskey. Camping and hiking in the great outdoors might be an exciting adventure for some, but even the hardiest of backpackers can come across the occasional problem with nature's terrible lack of facilities. Another friend of mine who I go camping with, I'm not sure if he's joking, but he says he wipes his butt when he shits in the woods with pine cones. I'm like... <laughs> What is up with you, fine going boy? Laura Strood was... Oh my, it is a strap and crap. Look at this, Sam. Mm. Actually, this isn't a bad idea, is it? Except this dude's wearing shorts. I mean, you got to take those off first. You, it's going to get real messy. Uh, <laughs> like, especially with this thing, it's going to be really squeezed in there. Lovely. Laura Strood was an outdoor enthusiast who felt particularly frustrated that sit-down toilets were quite hard to find in the remote wilderness. During a hiking trip to Colorado, Laura suffered a squatting mishap during which it sounded like things got very messy. And this drove her to design the cunning new solution for people who don't like the thought of squatting down in the countryside, the strap and crap. This was literally nothing more complicated than a harness which you strap around a tree then behind your back. Once you fastened it together, you can lean into a comfortable position which feels closer to being perched on a toilet than squatting among the wildlife i mean you really gotta like i mean you're gonna have i don't know how it is for women but we're gonna, there's, there's gonna be some pointing issues i mean or, or you're gonna spray urine all over your shorts because there's no toilet to catch it this is too much information i don't know i just don't think this is like great for me i don't want to do it i want to go home like i can't take the pressure of it the idea is that it takes the strain off your thighs and helps improve your aim, or as the genius marketing slogan suggests, now you can lessen the chance of messing your pants. Oh my god! The harness also comes packaged with handy gear loops on which to hold your toilet rolls, hand sanitizers, headlamp, and optional large bottle of whiskey. That is, that is a feature that I like, though. Um, it also doubles as a dog leash and a food hanger for those times when you really need to protect your provisions from grizzly bears. Also, I mean, it's like, yeah, what are we using to hang up the food in the trees? Well, I took shit with this device earlier. Let's use this. Cool. 
This coffee smells like shit. You could get your own strap and crap for just $25. And if you pledged $500 or more, you were entitled to a couple of t-shirts and stickers and a 15-minute telephone call with Laura. What a perk. I'm not entirely sure what you would talk about. Maybe you should just share the fun anecdote about that hiking trip in Colorado in full graphic detail. It's going to be weirdos donating $500, Co uh, Laura. You'll be like, Simon, don't kink shame! Be like, look, taking people, I mean, look, it's a little bit weird to be into scatology, isn't it? Isn't it? Is that okay? Can I still say that? It is 2021. I don't really know anymore. People in 2031 are going to be trawling through my business plays videos and being like, ah, oh, Simon, you f***ing asshole. How could you say that about people who like scatology? Scatology? Is that, that is right, right? Scat Look, it doesn't matter. Let's move on. Way too much talk about feces. It is shit. Sadly, Laura only managed to raise about 17% of the proposed $9,000 goal, as it seems that there's not enough people saw any real compelling attraction behind the strap and crap. I mean, it's not a bad idea, but it is just a piece of string. Or like, like... Just do it! I mean, just take a sh woods. Just squat down. My problem with squatting... Like, why are we talking so much about feces for sake i can never i've never mastered squatting enough to not have to remove my trousers so i have to get naked from the trousers down put them in a pile then i squat i do my business and then i have to put my clothes back on never seem to be able to master it uh, in, in case you're wondering it's because i kept soaking my trousers with urine <laughs> just to be absolutely clear on that one unless you suffered from trouble with your joints or were particularly worried about getting a bit uh, getting bit in the nethers by a snake. The invention didn't really seem worth the hassle of taking up so much precious room in your backpack. And although Laura later tried rebanding the product as a slightly less coarse loop and poop, it looks as if the product is nowhere to be found today. Poor Laura just didn't seem to grasp the best way of going about her business. But a bum bum dum! A Christmas gift from Jesus, or maybe Jesus. Um, I'm not sure if we're talking about a, a Mexican dude called Jesus or Jesus Christ. I wasn't actually aware until now that some people in the US get really angry about wishing them happy holidays during the Christmas season. <laughs> Fucking Scrooge. <laughs> or at least that's what some press headlines seem to suggest. Over here in the UK, we see headlines which report the blind outrage generated by threats to ban the poppy because it offends Muslims. How? How? Isn't the, the poppy in the UK is something we wear on the run up to Remembrance Day, which is November the 11th, to remember people who died in wars. You pay like a donation in a little box in a shop and you get a poppy, which you wear in your lapel. And I think the money goes to veterans. And maybe I'm really missing something about the cultural sensitivity of the poppy, but I always thought it was quite a nice thing. <laughs> or the UK government's shocking decision to ban Christmas nativity plays in schools, as these upset families belonging to different faiths. Really? Look, I don't give a shit about any of this religious nonsense. Like, I'm not Christian. It's fine. Just relax. It's just a bit of fun. Isn't it? Why do we need to be so upset about this? If they were like, <laughs> oh, whatever. Thousands of people get their knickers in a twist about this kind of thing, overlooking the fact that Muslims don't get offended by the poppy as many Muslim soldiers fought and died while serving in the British Army. <laughs> yes. And the government has never once spoken about banning nativity place. <laughs> Good! <laughs> I'm sure American viewers will correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but it seems to be kind of a similar story with the Happy Holidays controversy. Ah, because Happy Holidays is like secular. Why can't you say Happy Christmas? It's like, I don't know, I just chose Happy Holidays. Who gives a f Why are you so upset? Daddy, chill. Many people are alleged to be furious about an ongoing plot to replace the traditional Merry Christmas greeting with a more generic and non-offensive and all-inclusive Happy Holidays. I remember someone once said that you shouldn't write Xmas because it replaces Christ's name with an X. And I'm like, that is the like least, that is like the thing in my life that, I mean, there's things I really don't care about, like uh, Katy Perry's next album. But I mean, even the, the X over the Christ thing is like, wow, I mean, that is like, if Katy Perry's new album is like a, a 144th from the bottom, wow, we're really getting down into the 400s for that X thing. <laughs> I would hazard a guess that it's still actually not a crime to wish somebody a Merry Christmas. And according, and according to a public policy polling survey, around 80% of Americans don't really give a shit which greeting is used. Good! The groups most likely to be offended by somebody wishing them happy holidays are men, <laughs> strong conservatives, and Trump supporters. Shocking, shocking, 
and shocking. Maybe we could add men and women named Karen. <laughs> Uh, what's the male version of a Karen? Did we decide on that yet? I feel like the internet did decide and I forgot. It's ma male Karens. And, in fact, Trump pledged to get rid of the Happy Holidays greeting during his presidency. Really? In response to what he perceived to be a war on Christianity and Christmas. Is Trump religious? I guess he has to be, because he was president, so he's got to be like, yeah, yeah, I believe. Really, Trump? <laughs> I mean, it just seems like he's pandering to his base. Not sure how we am going to manage that, but he didn't, so probably best not to worry about it. Pfft. Already left my mind. However, one field production company was still seeking, seething about this political correctness and vowed to go on Indiegogo to take Christmas back with the planned production of a new movie called A Christmas Gift. And to that attracted some reasonably high profile talent. Maybe I've heard of any of them. I hope not. The script concerned a ruthless CEO and a hockey player who are based in New York and are trying to overcome personal difficulties during the season of faith and miracles at a push. I would guess they managed to overcome their problems with the help of Jesus. That's not really a spoiler, as the film seems doomed to fester in pre-production limbo. Da no one was worried about spoilers, Daddy. Absolutely no one. The campaign explained that Hollywood wouldn't allow the financing of the film as they were too scared of offending the PC police. Also a movie actually has to be good. I mean, getting money from Hollywood as like an unknown film producer, it's gotta be like blood from the stone. If I was like, I'm gonna make a movie, uh, the I, and it's like, I've got a little bit of like clout or like I could get people to see a movie. Um, that ain't happening though, is it? The campaign explained, uh, blah, 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 which is why the production company were now seeking $250,000 of funding from Indiegogo. I, they're going to raise some, right? Because there's people going to be, there's going to be an outrage. They're going to be like, yeah, I want to get behind this. MAGA for life. Uh, Isaac Florentine had agreed to direct the movie. A man whose most notable directing credits included the esteemed Mighty Morphin Power Rangers TV show from the 90s. And surprisingly, they'd also managed to persuade superstar Hollywood celebrity Kevin Sorbo to take on one of the lead roles. No, I've never heard of him either, Simon. Yes, Kevin Sorbo. You said reasonably high-profile talent. Who the f*** is Kevin Sorbo? Uh, but apparently he was briefly famous for playing the mythical title character in the 90s TV show Hercules The Legendary Journeys, which spawns the even more successful spin-off, Xena Warrior Princess. Okay, so I've heard of Xena Warrior Princess, and I've never heard of Hercules The Legendary Journeys, and I've definitely never heard of the lead actor uh, from the 90s TV show, which, like, really, come on, this <laughs> reasonably high profile. It's like, dude, you're on the C-list. Just be comfortable there, like your boy. Um... <laughs> C-list, please. Thank you. Uh, since those glory days, Kevin has become more famous for his outspoken Christian views and his support of Trump than his downhill acting career. Oh, we gotta do something with your time. He claims that he doesn't get offered any decent roles nowadays because he's a Christian. Yes, the long and storied history of Christian prosecution in the United States. But it might also be because he has a reputation for behaving like a dickhead. For example, during a radio interview in 2014, he defended allegations that his buddy Mel Gibson's 2004 film Passion of the Christ might be anti-Semitic by blurting out the following news message to the Jewish community. News bulletin. You did kill Jesus. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> Jesus was also a Jew. <laughs> Shit, son! This sounded like a three-way marriage made in Indiegogo heaven. A film that Hollywood wouldn't finance, starring an actor that Hollywood would, uh, won't cast, directed by, uh, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers guy. <laughs> it's as if the stars were aligning to make this movie happen. None of these guys have enough clout to raise enough money to make this movie. It's not getting anywhere close to 50 grand. You know, I know that, because there's, it's just, you can't, it's a lot of money. Of course it didn't happen. The film raised just over $6,000, or 2% of its target funding, but the flexible funding approach meant that producers still got to keep the money, even though there had been no update on the project since 2018, when it was claimed that the film was entering the pre-production phase. Sounds like a few lunches, doesn't it? $6,000? It's like, yeah, yeah, we're working really hard on it. Let's go for lunch. <laughs> Maybe it's because the whole campaign sounded like an angry political statement rather than an idea to make a film which encapsulates the spirit and meaning of Christmas. I have to say, I am surprised they didn't raise more than six grand. I mean, I didn't expect it to rate, like, raise 250, but that is, that is weak. You're weak. 
I can understand why Hollywood would rather bankroll a film about Santa than a film about Jesus. If I was the president of a major major film studio, I'd feel more confident in greenlighting The Last Temptation of Santa than I would greenlight Jesus Christ is Coming to Town. But that's not to say that there isn't a market for religious films. In fact, just a year earlier, Kevin Sorbert appeared in a surprise box office Christian hit God's Not Dead, which grossed over $62 million for a $66 million budget despite you getting panned by normal people as utter garbage. Oh my god, there's a Nicolas Cage movie called Left Behind, which I, um, well, how do I put this? I was on holiday, and let's just say I definitely didn't. It was, it was somewhere in Africa. Let's just keep it super generic. I was on holiday, somewhere in Africa. And there was a store that sold DVDs, which, I mean, I don't, I, I, I absolutely have no idea whether they were real or not. Um, but I definitely bought this movie, uh, legitimately, knowing absolutely nothing about it. And um, it was shite. <laughs> it was very weird and religious-y, and it was about the rapture. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> but I think it does okay in reviews because there are enough people who were like really religious -y to kind of lift it up. I mean, Nicolas Cage was the only person in that film who could actually act. So it's not as if these films or actors are blacklisted from cinema anyway. No, obviously not. They just can't get cast. Because <laughs> they suck. Allegedly. It just seems as if the main selling point of a Christmas gift was the phrase, Happy Holidays was guaranteed not to appear in it. Maybe the people behind the film should just stop uh, getting so wound up about the alleged war on Christianity arising from some people choosing to say Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas. I never even thought really about it. I'll be like, yeah, Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas, F changeable isn't it uh, i mean whatever who cares or maybe they should just let people use the phrase that they feel most comfortable with instead of trying to ban everything that doesn't conform with their own religious beliefs or maybe they should have just hired nicholas cage to drum up a bit more interest in their project he'll appear in any old shit and it would have and he would have made the perfect santa or jesus whatever <laughs> Mwah! i mean he has been in that really religious film left behind so he has done this Stolen memories. The looser regulations and guidelines of Indiegogo often means that there's more scope for outright scams. This is, and this is possibly the laziest crowd, crowdfunding scam I've ever come across, which is still, which still somehow managed to get a foot in the door and attract funding. The, there appears to have been a surge of interest in retro gaming over the last decade, and as a retro gamer myself, this warms the cockles of my heart. Not so long ago, I felt the computers and consoles of my youth would probably be forgotten forever, like a Yoko Ono B-side. Oh. If only everything by Yoko Ono would be forgotten, then we'd be living in a perfect world. But now I'm bombarded every day with marketing for new retro-themed products and gadgets and books, largely because the marketers know I will almost certainly buy them all. And many of the books are mighty fine. Small independent publishers such as Bitmap Books and Fusion have produced a long line of excellent volumes detailing the rise and fall of consoles and software houses of yesteryear and the obscurest of games that only 12 people bought in 1989. There's a brilliant book about the starting of uh, the guys who made Doom, the book called Masters of Doom. It is spectacular. The audiobook's uh, read by Wesley Crusher. It's extremely good. And I mean, Will Wheaton, who played Wesley Crusher in Star Trek The Next Generation, but Wesley Crusher. It's really good, and it's brilliantly narrated, and you should listen to it. Uh, one particular project on Indiegogo looks like the typical kind of book that was getting released at the time. The unofficial N64 and PS1 visual compendium may not have been entirely to my own retro tastes. I can remember the sad day I had to cancel my subscription to Strictly Retro Gamer magazine because it was getting too modern for me. Ah, the PS1. I had a PS1, I didn't have an N64, but one of my friends had an N64 and it was always exciting to go to their house and play the different games. It was great. They had Goldeneye though. Goldeneye was legit. Go. But for those with a nostalgic interest in these 90 consoles, the 90s consoles, the book appeared to provide a lavishly designed retrospective packed with color photographs and rich detailed content which covered every possible aspect of the two lumps of plastic. How complicated is this to get off the ground? Like, what is the scam here? You ended up not making the book? 
My dude, how hard was it? But as the project racked up excitable investment, a uh, few eagle-eyed users noticed that the nos uh, noticed that the nostalgia ain't what it used to be. I should point out that I corrected the title of the book, the orig as the original campaign listed it as a visual compendium rather than compendium. It's always wor a worrying sign when the author makes a typo in the title of the book. The presentation of the campaign left a lot to be desired too, or at least half of it did. Some of the campaign text and mock-up mock pages taken from the forthcoming book seem genuinely impressive and professional, but the other half looked dreadful and was littered with more typos and broken English. And there was good reason for this. The impressive stuff had actually just been stolen wholesale from a couple of previous crowdfunding campaigns for books which had successfully been produced by the acclaimed Geekline Publishing Company. But in a bid to make out that they weren't totally cheating, the makers of the new visual compendium also tossed a few chunks of original material which appeared as if it had been put together by a toddler <coughs> discovering the magic of crayon and language for the very first time time. It's difficult now. How guys? Selling the thing is the hard part. Like if you, if I was like, I'm going to make a book about the deliciousness of Magic Spoon cereal and then I got people to, that would be extremely hard to sell. But let's say I did sell 10,000 of these. My dude, I would put together the book. It's not like I'm building a rocket to Mars. It's something I can absolutely do. It's difficult to ascertain how much the project raised as Indiegogo has done a pretty good job of wiping the project from existence and pretending they never happened. Smart. It sounds as if the investors got their money back, but it reportedly took the platform several weeks to get around to finally shelving this bogus abomination of a backwards book. A very quiet orgy, oh my. You might be forgiven for assuming that the whole concept of crowdfunding was dreamed up by one of the great genius digital entrepreneurs who now runs a billion dollar company in Silicon Valley. But in fact, it was an idea first accidentally stumbled upon in the late 90s by a hairy old British prog rock band called Marillion who hailed from Aylesbury. I feel like I know where Aylesbury is. Maybe near where I used to live or where I grew up. Aylesbury. I feel like there's an industrial estate there. Aylesbury Industrial Estate, just, or maybe that's Aylesford Industrial Estate. I don't know. I feel like I've driven past road signs. I've never been there. <laughs> Why would I go to an industrial estate? <laughs> it's like, thanks for all the signposts of the industrial estate. Brilliant. <laughs> no, I know people do go there for business and activities that. Look, I don't know. I don't. This isn't. What? What? Let's stop this. Let's move on. This isn't even entertaining. Why am I telling this story? Why am I talking about industrial estates? Why is my life shit? The Tolkien-inspired name may not be too familiar outside of how many page fucking hell, Danny? What the hell, Danny? What is going on? Ah! My legs are so tired. I mean, I love blazing, but it's like, boy, come on. Danny, what the fuck, man? The Tolkien-inspired name may be not too familiar outside of Europe, but the band had been made. But the band had been major players in the 1980s, scoring a long list of big hits in the UK chart top and a UK chart-topping album following the departure of the curiously named Scottish lead singer Fish. <laughs> in, really? In 1987, the big I guess it's a stage name. Uh, the big hits and mainstream interest died dried up, but the band still maintained a fiercely loyal fan base. In 1997, though many of those Marillion fans were pestering the band to embark on a US tour, but the band, who had just recently been dropped by their record label EMI after disappointing sales, declared that they simply couldn't afford the sixty thousand dollars it would cost to set up such a tour. Yeah, that's a lot of money. That's really a lot of money. I guess as you are, yeah. You gotta fly there with all your shit and travel around the country and get venues and stuff, but it's gonna be profitable, right? That's the point. Uh, this led to the small a small group of fans setting up an online tour fund for Marillion, which demonstrated the incredible strength and uh, loyalty from these guys. Within six months, the fans had raised the full $60,000 to send Marillion to the United States. This sounds great so far. A Marillion? I mean, but. Really, on board with this? Because they're like, yeah, yeah, we're fans. We set it up. Now you guys can come. And it's like, guys, we we just said that because we didn't want to go. We've got loads of money. <laughs> Forty thousand dollars. <laughs> I'm rich. This in turn inspired the band to consider a similar tactic three years later when they were keen to release a new album but just didn't have the funds. Oh, so they did it. Great. Good for you. Sorry. This is fantastic. I think that's that is that is what Kickstarter this is what Kickstarter projects would be all about. Although if if you guys were like, yeah, bring Simon or we'll do a tour around America, and they'd be like, dude, business blaze life, Simon, we raised all the money for you. I'd be like, guys, that's not happening because you had to ask me first, <laughs> Jesus. I appreciate you. I love you. Buy some magic spoon. 
I'm sorry I called you the F word. I didn't mean it, it was just, just spur of the moment. I love you, legends. I meant it in the good way. Like you f uh, they got in touch with fans on their 30,000 strong mailing list, that is a mailing list, with an idea that opens with the humble words, how would you guys feel about buying a record we haven't made yet? Because if you did, we'd be really grateful. The result was the world's first entirely crowdfunded album, Anorachnophobia. Anorachnophobia, okay. In 2001, which managed to raise 150,000 pounds. Legendary. Before the band had even set foot in the studio, that is impressive. Far more than any advance the band would have received from a major record label along the way, Marillion had casually created an entirely new practice for raising capital. Since then, stacks of financially challenged artists and bands have successfully taken advantage of shrewd crowdfunding campaigns to help fund their latest album or tour, but not everybody gets it right. Perhaps the most embarrassing example of sonic crowdfunding occurred in 2013. Wait, are we just talking about these guys because they're a great example of doing it right? Respect! I thought these guys were gonna do something terribly wrong and then they're gonna be like, yeah, we never made the album, f you. But it turns out they just did this really well and this was a total success. F respect. <laughs> but not everybody gets it right. Perhaps the most embarrassing example of Sonic crowdfunding occurred in 2013 when the massive new metal band Orgy finally announced their long-awaited comeback. No, I hadn't heard of them either, Simon. Me neither. Obviously. Oh, Danny, Danny. Don't make assumptions about me, Danny! But he's absolutely correct. To be fair, they weren't very big to begin with. Hailing from Los Angeles, the band who described themselves as delivering a distinctive brand of death pop scored a few minor hit singles. Sing, sing goals. Jesus Christ, whistle. Uh, in the US around the turn of the millennium before fizzling out with a gothic whimper. Following a long hiatus, the band announced their plans for a comeback on Indiegogo with the words multi-platinum selling band Orgy is back and ready to dominate once again. Will he support Orgy in the rise back to the top? Multi-platinum? Uh, I'll just... The band has scored a few hit singles in the US. Okay, yeah, you get a few hit singles. Well, they, they're multi-platinum, fair enough. Jesus Christ, that's cool though. While technically only one member of the band was back from the original five-piece lineup, only one of the original members was still standing, although at least it was the frontman Jay Gordo. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's the guy who plays bass. <laughs> What's the album? Boom, 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 boom. Boom 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 track two boom 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 repeat You'd be disappointed if you shelled out good money to see a Beatles reunion concert only to find that it was just Ringo and three of his cronies from down the pub. Perhaps, sorry Ringo, perhaps part of the reason why the campaign bombed so spectacularly is because a few a few people could really remember Orgy first time round. That might sound harsh, and I'm sure they had some followers, but they certainly didn't enjoy the big devoted fan base of a band like, say, Meridian. Yeah, I mean, if you've got multi-platinum though, you've got to, this is the thing, you could go multi-platinum with a few hit singles, but it's like, like, you're not gonna have like a big fan audience. It's just you had a you had a hit. No one's gonna be on your mailing list being like, where's the next album? It's like, no, I just liked your song, whatever it was called. Another reason might have been the sheer arrogance of the pitch. Whereas most successful campaigns in this genre tend to invite fans to become part of a thrilling new journey, Audrey just seemed to be asking you to help them become rich and famous again. I mean, there is a there is something to be said for being direct. Like, I feel like Business Blaze is quite direct. I'll tell you what I think about the products that will sponsor us. I'll tell you what I think about my thoughts about certain things. Obviously, it can go wrong. I'm definitely going to get cancelled at some point. But there is something about direct. Like, if I had an Indiegogo, it's like, help someone... So Help Simon become a multi-platinum best-selling artist. On his, I'll get a bass guitar, we'll just play it. It'll be great. I mean, there's something to be said for that, I have to say. But you can't, like, also don't be a dick, but then also I'm a bit of a dick. But I don't know why this works when I do it, but it just feels super easy to f*** up somehow, and I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> What is going on? Uh, in a project campaign they wrote, with your backing we can launch Audi, uh, Orgy into an international and internet. That you, um, you had, you, you, you could, you do. Into a national and international name once again. That does sound very self-serving. As Axel Rosenberg from the Metal Sucks website noted, it felt as if the band had forgotten the golden rule of crowdfunding. You should always try and accentuate the power of the crowd rather than just the funding. <laughs> It's all about the Benjamins, baby. 
Uh, or maybe it's just because they were asking for a ridiculously over-optimistic sum of money. Most bands would ask for somewhere in the region of $30,000 to fund a new recording and are likely to throw some thoughtful exclusive perks set at a modest price. For example, you might get a chance to perform with a band for, say, $500. I'm wondering, like, where's the money at? You had multi- uh, how many albums is multi-platinum? Certification is often ordered cumulatively and it's possible for a single, single album to be certified silver, gold, and platinum in turn. An album becomes platinum twice over, for example, if an, it has sold two million copies in the United States. Double platinum or multi-platinum. Okay, so you need to sell two million albums, which is insane. <laughs> I just realized that is never gonna happen for me uh, because I'm not a musical artist, but even if we made a joke about it, there's no way two million of these things would be sold. Even if I sold them for like a dollar, that's like two million dollars. In contrast, Audrey was asking for a hundred thousand dollars. Welcome to all the money, boys. Uh, and the five hundred dollar perk was simply a one-hour music lesson with a member of the band via Skype. I mean, if you're a big fan, that'd be pretty sick. Like, there are bands I like. Although I don't know what I'd ever say to the people. A band I liked was like, we're raising money for our next album, and I'm like, I got money. I'll I'll donate. Like. Assuming he has something cool in return, but a one-hour call with the, like the front man of the band, I'd be like, I don't know, I'd just be a bit uncomfortable. I wouldn't know what to say. It's like, oh my god, I love your music. Okay. I feel it's like I don't know when I meet people in the real world who who know me, it's always quite brief because most people are just like, hey, oh my god, I love your stuff, and I'm like, thanks, that's awesome. And I love, don't get me wrong, I love meeting people in the real world. It's like, hey, what's up? This is awesome. And obviously it's fantastic for my giant ego. But it rarely goes much deeper than that. And I'd really struggle to have a one hour. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't think. I don't know. Uh, cut this section because it's not entertaining. Unless you think it is entertaining, then leave it in, Sam. But I get the feeling that is one thing where, you know, you'd be like, Simon, uh, you know, uses the, uh, is it the super bad meme where he's like, that's an amazing story, please tell it again. Uh, and then I'm always like, it got boring. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it would be a bit weird. I wouldn't know what to say to, they would just like, okay. Okay. Um, if you dug deeper into your pockets and paid for the $20,000 Fuck. Perk. The band would agree to play at your private events, and they would hang around with you the following day so that you'll have them all to yourself to do anything you want. Oh my. Uh, I would love... I mean, that is like some epic shit. Like, there are bands I like, and it's like, having one of those bands, bands play at just a party you have would be fucking sick. Like, I totally get, like, that rich person thing where it's like, I can, you know, this band, they're just, they're just playing here. That is like so cool. <laughs> and, but I would want them to leave afterwards because the next day I'd probably be hungover. I reach. Oh. This might sound like a tempting offer if you had the money you could possibly spend the day explaining to them how good, a, uh, how a good crowdfunding campaign works. Unfortunately, not one person bought any of those silly perks and in total the campaign managed to raise just $6,276 of their $100,000 goal. This naturally led to widespread derision amongst the metal press which forced the band into issuing a humble admission of failure in response. Well, kind of. They wrote, the fact that a few haters are posting such childish remarks makes you wonder what created this kind of attitude. Simple answer is jealousy and stupidity. We didn't fail. This sounds like Donald Trump, doesn't it? It's like, you did fail. No one's jealous of anything because you you raised $6,000. 6% of your goal. The record is coming along great and sounds awesome. So why did you need the money to begin with? Hey, childish haters, get ready because the new music will speak for itself, no doubt. Well, let it. And if it does, well, people will buy it, won't they? It's called the pre-market. It's great. It does this. Um, I suppose it's arguable whether they failed or not, as the flexible financing model meant that they could keep the money they raised from one of the worst crowdfunding campaigns in history. Give the money back, for fuck's sake. And it could also be argued that this Indiegogo show had given the band more press coverage than they enjoyed in well over 15 years. Although the band still apparently exists today, things are getting pretty quiet on the orgy front. Meanwhile, over 20 years since they invented crowdfunding, the consistently unfashionable Marillion are still going as strong as ever. And I'm going to go check them out right now, because they seem like legends. 
this has been an episode of Business Blaze brought to you by Magic Spoon. And you should go get some Magic Spoon right now for the reasons that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Purchase the merch.co for merch. Beardblaze.com for Beardblaze oils. RottingTurtle.co, I believe. No, maybe .net. I don't know. Let's not plug it yet. It's not even ready. Thank you for watching. Que a Pablo Escobar se le respeta. Hijo de